So moving on then uh, in Slaughterdyke to chapter 3, which is called Humans in the Magic Circle on the Intellectual History of the Fascination with Closeness, Slaughterdyke now begins to move on and further develop his idea of, of, the, of the subject, the, the hollow subject and the symbiotic subject by demonstrating in this chapter, he uses three models to demonstrate the idea of the emergence of a subjectivity uh, in the form of a temporarily closed microspheric bubble that activates a sort of magic circle that encompasses partners or two subjects within it that end up with a shared subjectivity that is resonantly spread between the two partners. So we have this, again, once again, this idea of consciousness as, uh, as symbiotic. Uh, the basic minimal unit for Slaughterdyke for a microsphere is the dyad. Uh, all microspheres are at least bipolar. They can be multipolar, they can be more than that, but they're at least bipolar. So this is this idea uh, of the self. And uh, to, to recap then, we had seen that his idea of the self had begun uh, by evoking the myth of Yahweh scooping up mud and creating Adam as a hollow figurine and then blowing breath into it, and that the blowing of the breath into it animates Adam as a subject, and it simultaneously animates Yahweh as a subject, so that you have two subjects uh, interfacially interlocked there as a single microsphere. But this idea of the hollow self, now, a couple of words about that. Uh, the hollow self is the self, it's the slaughter Dikean self, and it's the self uh, in contemporary society after World War II that begins to come into being and replaces the transcendently sealed self of the metaphysical age. During the metaphysical age that had extended from Descartes to Husserl, the self was this sort of transcendent entity with a completely sealed uh, membrane around it, uh, sealed by God and guaranteed by God, so that the membrane was not so much like uh, the membrane of a cell, which is osmotic, after all, and allows things to pass in and out of it, but more like a fortress wall. Uh, the self was sealed and it was transcendent and it existed in the mode, of course, of what Heidegger called uh, Vorhandenheit, which is the mode of self-sufficient entities, uh, transcendent entities that are not necessarily related to anything else. They're, they're de-worlded, just as the objects in science are de-worlded. In order for science to study an object at all, it has to cut its object, whether it's an atom, let's say, or a cell, it has to slice it out as figure out of the ground, the contextual ground in which that figure is embedded, it has to slice it out and turn it into a pure object in itself, uh, divorced from all context whatsoever. So this is what science does, and this is the mode of self-subsistent entities, and this is the mode that both Heidegger and Sloterdijk counter. Heidegger's, uh, Heidegger embeds the self back into, as Dasein, uh, we're in a world involved in tasks, and uh, we have this mode of interreferentiality, just as the objects that we use are not in the mode of Vorhandenheit, but Zuhandenheit. That is to say that my hammer exists as part of a world, a whole world of tools that brought it into being and without which it could not exist as a separate entity. Same thing with the Sloterdijkian self here. The Sloterdijkian self of post-modernity is a hollow self. He doesn't say why it's a hollow self. I have my own ideas about this, but uh, he doesn't say why uh, the, the contemporary self is hollow, just that it is, and that it's leaky, and that it's subject to invasion by other entities, other beings, astral spirits, paranoia. It's a leaky self. It's a little bit, I think David Lynch in his films is, is the perfect exemplar of the Sloterdijkian leaky or osmotic self. Uh, Lost Highway is a classic example of this in which the main character there is, is open and is invaded by an astral presence that comes in and shifts his identity around. This characteristic of shifting identities uh, is not a trait of the metaphysical age from, from Descartes to Husserl. You don't find it there at all. The, the subject is, is a concrete thing in that age. Now the subject, under the, I believe the impacts of electronic technology, is, uh, is leaky and open uh, to symbioses and also to astral invasions and to paranoia and so forth. So this is the, the kind of model of the subject now that Sloterdijk wants to put forth, and he does so with his brilliant theory of the self as basically bipolar. It's always in a symbiotic relationship just like Lynn Margulis's uh, bacteria are always engulfed inside of larger cells, uh, so too the self is always engulfed inside uh, larger structural unities that have membranes that can find new, su new shared subjectivities that form the basis of spheres, microspheres first and then gradually eventually macrospheres. So this is the, the idea in this chapter, which is largely a devotion to a study of animal magnetism and hypnotism,
what he wants to say, and it's a little bit hard at first to, to see what relation it has, but it's the idea that just as uh, one's consciousness as a fetus is inside the mother, so too in the hypnotist's relationship to the subject that he hypnotizes, the hypnotist actually enters into the personal space of the subject that is being hypnotized. So he's actually inside of the, of the subject, the somnambulist mind. And so there's a, there's a kind of biune relationship, a symbiosis there of the two consciousnesses that's analogous to that of the fetus inside of the mother. But he begins the chapter. It has three models, the first one being the, the pre-modern, pre-metaphysical model from the Renaissance of the, uh, from Renaissance magology, Renaissance magic um, of the model of the lover and the beloved that Marsilio Ficino talks about in his various commentaries about Plato. And uh, he talks about how uh, the self in the love process emanates from the heart rays that go out of the eyes and enter actual rays, actual effluences, magical effluences that enter through the eyes of another person, enter into that other person, and into that person's heart. So that uh, the relationship of love or infatuation or whatever it is, is the, the, the direct function of a magical sphere of emanations that is formed almost like an ellipse. And Sloterdijk says that microspheres are not truly round, they're actually non-round spheres, ellipses, more like ellipses than anything else, because they're made up of two uh, polar entities. And when you ha if you have a model of the self that, that's bipolar, then uh, neither ego can be said to be in the center anymore. So uh, this is what you have in Ficino's uh, magical theory of uh, the, the lover and the beloved connecting through magical emanations through the eyes. Then he goes on and he talks about Giornano Bruno a uh, hundred years later talking about a general theory about bonds and how bonds and sympathies exist all throughout the cosmos and also in the social sphere how the more intelligent someone is uh, the more bonds that they're able to form with other people and with other entities. The stupider people are capable of forming fewer bonds and hence I suppose fewer, fewer microspheric relations. And then so he talks about Giordano Bruno but uh, in Renaissance magic as a kind of pre-early version of depth psychology. This is, this is the earliest, this, is, this chapter is basically an archaeology of depth psychology that goes back and sees the earliest origins of depth psychology in these Renaissance me theories about magical circles that are formed between human beings and between human beings and the rest of the cosmos. And these are leaky selves. They're, they're like Sloterdijk's model of the contemporary self as an osmotic or leaky self, easily penetrated by other effluences. Uh, because this is pre-Descartes. Descartes comes along in the following century after Giordano Bruno and begins drawing a very firm membrane around the ego which begins to stabilize and solidify in the grand metaphysical age of absolute subjects beholding absolute objects uh, in three-dimensional Cartesian phase space. But then he says that uh, the sequel to this, this, the second model that he wants to talk about and the main one for this chapter is that of animal magnetism, hypnotism, and mesmerism uh, Anton Mesmer uh, was a German in the late 18th century who came along with these ideas. And the idea of mesmerism, it once again, is the formation then of these, these earlier Renaissance magical theories reappear in the context of mesmerism insofar as the magnetizer, as he was called, who magnetizes the subject, enters into the consciousness of the subject and forms a symbiotic circle with him. But that subject can also be thought to be capable of accessing this is an early version of depth psychology, to be capable of accessing early memories, especially natal memories, of actually being inside the mother womb. In this theory, you can regress a, a person to a state where they'll become aware of the consciousness that they had when they were, when they were inside the mother womb. And so note that we have like uh, the Russian babushka or, or the, 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 the Russian dolls, one inside of another. We have the magnetizer or the hypnotist consciousness inside the subject's consciousness that he hypnotizes who is then also through trans regression inside the consciousness of being inside the mother womb. So it's like a series of nested, holonically, holonomically uh, invested or encased consciousnesses one inside the other. And so this is the model that he talks about in the, the, the second example of the formation of temporarily closed biune microspheres of animal magnetism. Then he goes on and he talks about the third model of Fichte's model of uh, the relationship between the teacher and the listener. And Fichte was aware of animal magnetism, as was Hegel and hypnotism. And he drew a deliberate analogy to 
the philosopher, I guess namely Fichte himself, in the auditorium lecturing to the listeners, and the listener forms a symbiosis with the philosopher, uh, a magic circle, insofar as it is analogous to animal magnetism, insofar as the listener is receptive and in an ecstatic, rapturous trance, uh, and generally has a poorly formed ego, which enables this to happen, uh, the philosopher has a highly developed ego. It's been developed and solidified through reading uh, and through uh, the acquisition of ideas, which solidifies the ego. And that philosopher, though, is also embedded in the larger macrosphere of God, who has sort of guaranteed him, and, and of whom he is almost a sort of incarnation or avatar of, of enlightenment rationality, the philosopher of this time is. And so the ideal listener in the auditorium is the one uh, who is wrapped in a state of fascination, is ecstatic outside themselves, and is in, forms this open circle with the philosopher who is giving the lecture. And so that's the third model uh, of the creation of a, uh, of, of a biune microsphere. Now, uh, the microsphere does not necessarily, that forms between human beings, does not necessarily just have to be bipolar. It can be multipolar. And he'll go on later to talk about other, other polarities, other uh, subjects that can appear within the magic ring. But these are the concrete examples that he gives in this chapter uh, of the kind of osmotic, leaky self that he sees in the Heideggerian mode of uh, Zuhandenheit, uh, insofar as it is referential, refers to other entities and grabs them and includes them within its sphere uh, as a model that is counter to the traditional closed transcendent subject uh, that existed from Descartes to Husserl in the metaphysical age. So that's the significance of this chapter. It comes uh, after the chapter where he had talked about uh, the heart and, and then the chapter on faciality, and it comes before the next chapter when he gets into the significance of the great mother and the history of always being inside the mother womb. That's up next. Mm -hmm.